Okay, well, Christy, thank you so much and great to be here this evening. I'm also based here in Hong Kong, so um, wonderful to hear that there's a number of you there in the classroom with Christy and her team down at the campus at, uh, in Causeway Bay. And, um, and please God, next time I'll, I'll be able to make it down to the actual campus as well. But I think we've got some people on the phone. And uh, my job tonight is to spend a little bit of time talking about the alternative investment industry. My word, there's been an awful lot of different things happening. Uh, markets are certainly interesting right now. And I'm hoping to take the next 15 or so minutes to walk through and share with you a little bit about my thoughts and opinions on what's currently happening in the alternative investments industry and why I think it's really an asset class and the entire part of our market to be more familiar with and indeed more aware of. So with that, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the why and the rise of this sector. I'll talk a little bit about where the career opportunities are. Let's face it, we've all got to future proof ourselves and think about where opportunities might sit ahead. And um, I'll then spend some time walking through the higher exam itself. And I'd be delighted to hand the mic at that point across to Larry, who is the official trainer of the prep course, which is provided by Kaplan. Um, and then we'll take some questions and answers as well before Christy shares with you some information too. So a nice full agenda for us. And with that, I will start my part of the presentation. So we're here at the Kaya um, Association. We are a global professional body. Um, and our real aim in life is to invest first. In order to do well by our investors, we have to have great and wide familiarity on how different asset classes work. And so... Are really focus exclusively on providing education there. Hi, Christy, is everything okay? Ah, hi, Christy, can you hear me? Yes, the connection just <laughs> broke a bit. Maybe can you repeat um, uh, one minute? If... <laughs> sorry. Okay, sure, sorry. Oh, sorry, the line dropped there. I was saying that the Kaira professional body um, and we focus on all things relating to education and insurance, the investor, the person at the very, very top of the food chain in our ecosystem very much comes first. As a global membership organization, we have over 11,000 members around the world. And just today, um, we announced our results for our level two um, exam from earlier in the year. And so that number is set to swell as more um, and new members come into our ranks. And they're across over a hundred different countries as well. So very much a global organization and um, focused on the alternative. So why is and why should we be thinking about the alternative investments industry? Well, really something that has happened in the last couple of years and most notably in the last 12 months is investors are recognizing that diversification is something that requires a good deal more attention than perhaps it has been given over the last 10 years. Um, post the global financial crisis, um, beta market returns were very, very easy to come by um, and very, very easy to obtain. You could buy an equity index, go home, or maybe even an ET, go home and look like a hero with the returns that people have enjoyed from those asset investments. It's getting tougher now. Um, and so diversifying across a broader array of investment targets is something which investors are much more keenly thinking about giving thought to and indeed actioning. Um, additionally, with the sheer volume of capital that's been thrown into our banking and our financial systems around the world, there's a very real worry about inflation is heading our way and alternative investments are known to provide a brilliant inflation hedge. And then moreover, um, those easier returns that I touched on, those beat returns, those market returns, the world has enjoyed for a good many years, they're unlikely to continue. And so all of these items are really directing much more attention to the private markets, the alternative investment landscape. And with that, you see what's actually happened. There's been a monumental growth in the assets managed within the alternative investments industry. You've got a some 60% increase is forecast over the next five years. 
And if you look at the assets back in 2010, just $4 trillion of assets were under management. And that had swollen to almost $11 trillion as of the end of 2020. We're going to see an almost doubling of that number by the end of 2025. So the actual projected growth across the entire ecosystem of alternative investments is really, really unprecedented. And for us here in the Asia Pacific is an even more rosy story, whereby look at the CAGR of return and growth we're expecting across the Asia Pacific landscape. So we're at about 1.6, $1.7 trillion of assets as we exited 2020. And that's let's set to threefold increase to over $5 trillion by the end of 2025. So as far as being in the right place at the right time, for us that are working in alternatives or wanting to work in alternatives within the Asia Pacific, I see a very, very rosy future in front of us. Now, PwC pulled together some further data, taking those numbers I pulled and shared there from Prequin. They added their own flavor to what they expect to be seeing, what they actually think will be happening within the alternative investments asset under management growth here in Asia over the next five years. The big areas to focus upon is the growth in private equity that's set to more than double in the next five years as people rush to find private equity and venture capital investments. And moreover, look at that growth in infrastructure that's planned from the ending of 2020 through to 2025. And that's really when we think about the middle class explosion, the consumer spending, and the millennials, the sheer number of millennials that we have um, looking to do different things across the region. Think of the roads that we're building. Think of the, the, please God, we'll get to use them again in the future. Think about the airports that we're going to need to move our, our populations around. The sheer growth in the infrastructure sector we're going to see, again, within the next five years is just extraordinary. And with that, we'll bring some amazing opportunities for each of us. Also, the big institutional investors, the sovereign wealth funds, the central governments, the big pension funds and superannuation funds, they're all making significant allocations into alternatives. It's quite unusual to see an institutional investor these days that has nothing in alternatives in their portfolio. Just one in four um, of investors around the world have zero allocation to alternatives. But look at the sheer number that have at least four or five or six different types of alternative investments in their portfolio. So very much what we're seeing here is investor appetite across the board to have more things in their portfolios is only growing. And looking at this graph at the bottom of this slide in front of you that we're walking on through now, you'll see that back in 20, um, 20, uh, 2002, the actual mixture between fixed income, cash and private markets is very different to how it was for big sovereign wealth funds as we exited 2018. The trend is here. It's definitely growing pace and more and more investors are wanting access to alternative investment. Now, public markets, the cash, the equity, and the fixed income um, have been an amazing deliverer of returns over the last 10 years, as I mentioned, but that's very much beta market returns. What private markets offer is more alpha, some of the more un, um, kind of distinguishable, unidentifiable things that are happening in the private market sector. And again, the growth that we're going to see across the private market sector will take us from that four or so trillion in a 10 trillion that I mentioned by the end of 2025. And this is on the back of trillion dollars of fresh capital coming into the private market sector year on, year off for at least the last three years. And indeed, we saw the exact same thing happen in 2020. So again, investors are wanting to put and deploy more capital into the alternative investments landscape. And that's clearly demonstrated here when we look at just how much capital has been raised um, to be allocated into the market that we see. Now that's being stimulated by this. The fact is the world has really gone private. If you look at what happened over on the top right hand side here um, from uh, an investment perspective, when we looked at the um, investment side, that public to private ratio of returns is very, very different. 
just $25 million was raised privately before that security chose to go public. And at that point, it raised a further $1.9 billion of capital in its IPO. But look at Facebook. They raised some $2.4 billion in the private market. That wasn't going via a listing or going out into the public um, domain. That was from family and friends and private investors that supported the growth of Facebook. My gosh, by the time we got to Uber, they raised $22 billion of money from private sources and only raised 8.1 when they came to launch themselves with an IPO. And again, look at this. Again, companies are staying private for longer. So whether you look at Twitter, whether you look at Uber or Facebook, all of that growth for a good chunk of the growth, the return is enjoyed by those private investors versus when the company has been listed and goes public and then that actually becomes different returns for the public or the IPO starts of investment. So more companies are absolutely staying private for longer. And with that, there'll be many more and an increasingly larger number of new products in the private markets domain for investors to enjoy and also take advantage of. Now, investors continue to think about private equity, private debt, infrastructure specifically, and quite um, 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 in great number when they think about whether they'll increase or indeed increase significantly over the coming five years. Interesting to note that hedge funds are seeing a bit of a detraction or indeed a significant detraction given some of the return dynamics that hedge funds have delivered in recent years. However, this survey was taken at the end of 2020. And if you look at the returns hedge funds have made in Q1 of 2021, I'd like to have had kind of some personal investments in many of them. There's been some amazing returns enjoyed within the private markets and the hedge fund um, sector over the last few months. Now, from a career opportunities perspective, I'm a big believer and we should be looking to future-proof ourselves and think about the tools that we need to be relevant, maintain our relevance, maintain our engagement and be, be good social um, professionals and responsible professionals. And again, really, if you're thinking about alternative investments, anything in the private market sector, so private equity, venture capital, real estate, infrastructure, commodities, resources, all of those sectors are going to see great growth, be it in the front office, as a portfolio manager, as an analyst, in the middle office, in the back office, you're going to see some amazing opportunities that present themselves within the career landscapes in private markets. The other area I think we're going to see some great opportunity in is where investor access is coming from. That area of highlight at the bottom of this graph in red is indicating where organizations today are not providing products to, att to attract and bring in assets from retail investors, but they're looking to aggressively develop and build and hone and craft new products to bring um, that retail um, investment dollar to their table. Great chart, I've not got it in this particular presentation, but a great chart shows that there's an inflection point We've just recently gone through whereby there's more capital in retail pockets than there are in, in, in other people's pockets, or the, the more professional investor. And that's going to grow to see more middle class growth, particularly in Asia. So product providers and product crafters are wanting to find new ways to get investments from the non-professional investor. We can talk a little, little bit maybe about fractional ownership or tokenization, some of the things that are actually happening to democratize access to return. They're no longer only accessible by the very, very high net worth individual and institutional investor. We're gonna see a lot more retail offering of products within the private market space in the months and the years ahead. ESG, oh my gosh, I don't think you can pick up a newspaper or read a, a news blog post or see anything where those three letters, environment, social, and governance don't get some airtime. Alternative investments particularly have been behind the curve on developing a, a system and a plan and a process to incorporate the rhythms and the disciplines of ESG. That has changed dramatically as investors are demanding 
their end investment groups that they're working with have to adapt, have to evolve, and have to implement some changes to have a robust and, and a coherent, well thought out ESG policy. We're seeing some amazing things happen across the entire ecosystem. And again, I think the career opportunities within the ESG sector, again in Asia, given where we are in the whole life cycle of investment, is going to be pretty, pretty interesting. For all of us here today, um, with Christie's blessing, we will share with you a link to download a free module on ESG. So if you're keen to learn more about the disciplines and to supplement your knowledge on the ESG landscape, the fundamentals um, one hour module here will help you with that. And we hope that each of you today will enjoy that hour spend of watching some videos and learning a little bit more about how the ESG landscape works. And again, with Chris's blessing, we'll share that with each of you post today's event. The other significant area of opportunity career-wise is in how assets are valued. And as I mentioned before, jobs and career progression, career um, ideas and, and opportunities aren't just in the front office. There's an awful lot of development going on in some of the supplementary services which support the front office roles. And one of the biggest challenges for private markets, unsurprisingly, is how do you value the assets? There isn't a stock exchange where you go and get a price for a ship or a toll booth or a tunnel or a port, which many of these infrastructure, for example, projects are. There's not a, a listed price for many private equity investments or indeed to get a listed price for a building if you've made a real estate investment. So moreover, investors say, I bought a shipyard, I bought a boat or I own a building. How much is it worth? And therefore, imagine the complexity of actually of, of assembling a reflective valuation on a port or on a ship, for example. So there's some amazing developments happening in how technology is helping these non-listed assets get reflective, timely, and accurate pricing. So me as an investor, I can look at my overall asset portfolio and have a good feel for my asset valuation as well. So I think there's going to be some really interesting things happen around the valuation side of price. A more soft side of where I think there'll be some great opportunities is when we think about DNI or diversity and inclusion, or is it kind of increasingly being called the DEI, di uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion? There are many more um, organizations that are fighting to have better equality um, within the ranks of financial servicing um, organizations. And again, investors are voting with their feet. They're not just pushing groups to have better ESG policy. They're absolutely demanding that if I've given you money to invest on my behalf, you've got to have a thoughtful, reflective, and up-to-date, accurate D and I or DEI um, policy in place as well. So I'm really excited about the changes that we're seeing across this particular landscape. And I absolutely think we're going to see a good deal more over the months and years in front of us. Unsurprisingly, the other big opportunity here is tech. Now we think about data, it's now more valuable than oil. Um, the best asset on our planet is absolutely data. So when you kind of have those cookies like you go to, you know if something's for free, you're the product. We've all been on databases and, and accessing to different things where we see um, our information is being used but that also is being harnessed and collected and harvested and assembled into some meaningful statistics. And again, technology is gonna play a very, very important role in how the financial services regimes evolve and how the investment um, landscape progresses. And so again, I think there's gonna be some great opportunities within the, the data and the tech side of the world. It's pretty rare now to go into a fund management office or to go onto a trading floor anywhere in the world and there isn't a data scientist who's been hired or entire banks of data scientists who have been hired to help that group or that make better investment decisions. So again, I think we're going to see some exciting things occur there. Now, I hope that backdrop has piqued your interest or made you feel a little bit excited about the opportunity within alternative investments ahead. And maybe I'll just pivot at this point and spend the next five or so minutes talking about the Kaya program. 
I know Larry's got some great knowledge to share with you as well. And I'm keen to pass the bat on to him for his great sharing and information. So before we do that, I do want to just talk a little bit about the Kaya um, designation and the program for which I'm employed by and I work for. So post completing the Kaya designations, our two level exam, you become a charter holder. And this is the certificate that you get at the end of all that hard work and that effort that you put in. And you become a card carrying Kaya member. We can put the CAIA letters after your name. Um, and that's what you get post completing the two levels of our curriculum. Level one, pretty much about core concept, introduction to alternative investments. So if you've got a financial services background or a finance undergrad or postgrad, a lot of the actual discipline of traditional investment is well known to you. We build upon that to help craft and teach the learnings around the things that make up alternative investments. So again, we look at real assets, we look at private markets, we look at private equity, venture capital, the different pillars that make up alternative investments. We talk about those disciplines in great detail as we rip apart how to evaluate, how to understand, and what makes up those different core parts of the alternative investments industry. Post level one comes level two, and here we really build upon that knowledge that we, st we stepped in in level one. Here at level two, we're looking at the allocators approach. Now, very often I, I, I describe the Kaya program as being something from an investor for an investor or from an investor to someone who's advising an investor. So if you're wanting to be aware of how and why these investments are helpful in portfolios, if you want to know how and why they should be part of your investment portfolio, understand them is very much the key part of level one. And then we build upon that knowledge here in level two. We look at modeling, we look at the policies around how investments are made. We look at risk management, a very different risk investing in a hedge fund or a private equity fund than investing in a, a stock or a bond, for example. We look at due diligence, both operation and indeed investment due diligence. Because again, evaluating a venture capital investment, for example, um, from an investment due diligence perspective is very different from buying a listed security or um, a recognized authorized mutual fund. So again, we get into a great deal of knowledge around the advanced concepts of how the alternative investments industry is structured and indeed how it operates. Now we've actually moved to a new um, model um, of our curriculum and um, we released this back in April of last year. And so we have got a refresh of our curriculum for both level one and indeed for that occurred both during 2020 and here in 2021. There are new complements of content in 2021's level two exam. And in fact, the candidates who set the level two in March of this year, they use this new curriculum for the first time. So there's a much broader array of content now in both the level one and the level two. The challenge of the curriculums for alternatives is the market keeps changing and we have to keep adding new stuff. And again, I'm sure Larry will talk a little bit more about that in his part of our presentation. We've also moved to uh, an efficient learning platform um, in time for our next exam round for our candidates. And it's a digital environment where all of our curriculum, all of the learning resources, all of your notes and so forth may be um, contained in one central repository. And again, that's due for our level one and our level two candidates. Now, I'm not sure whether we've got any CFA charter holders either in the room there with Christy and the team or indeed on the phone. Um, but the great um, thing for CFA members is we have um, a stacking program where you may move straight through to level two of the Kaya program. And that's because we feel the level one content of the Kaya program would have been covered across level one, level two, and level three of the CFA program sufficiently enough for you to progress directly through to the level two of the Kaya program. So if you are a CFA charter holder, do get in touch. I'm happy to give you a little bit more information. Uh, but you're actually able to go straight to level two, which I'm sure you'll think of being as 
rather good news. And I touched on some of those materials available via the learning um, platform. There's also an awful lot of material on the Kaya website under our preparing part of the website. There's these sorts of webinars. There's that access to sample exams. There's access to training resources. And importantly, and in reflection to the work here from the great team at Kaplan, the material on how you might need some help to get through the program as well. So there's some information on the third party preparatory courses such as Kaplan who can help you. We know that more than half of our members around the world didn't do it alone. Uh, they needed to have some help or just the rhythm and the discipline of having some help from a third party. And so that information is all freely available online. And we encourage you to have a look at that preparing part of the website to learn a little bit more. Now, the question we always get asked, and I'm sure um, Larry would have been asked this if I hadn't been asked this, is, well, how difficult is it? What's the passing rate? And so I pulled out the pass uh, rate for both level one and level two for the last three years for you here. And as you see, it's about that mid fifties for the level one exam and around that mid sixties for the level two exam um, from the pass rate perspective. So all those that sit the exam, that's what the pass rate is for those who are successful. Now from a cost perspective, these costs here are in US dollars. There's an enrollment fee and there's an administration fee. We are still in that early bird window. Um, you can therefore register and save yourself that $100, um, which is in place until May 17th. Um, and again, something we do encourage you to do is speak to your managers um, if this um, is covered from your employer or speak to your human resources department. And if you have any challenges there or you have any questions there, we here at Kaya will happily speak to your HR team. We do a lot of work with the human resources department of banks and financial services group across the world. And we can certainly help them learn more about how Kaya um, is something they should support their employees to go through. But here you see where the costs are for the fees of the exam, the books themselves, the curriculum, and then indeed what the annual membership fees come through at as well. Now, when we speak to those 11,000 plus members, we actually ask them, well, well, what have you found helpful about getting a Kaya program? How did this help you? And I think most the, the, the biggest feedback we get is the ability to show proficiency and understanding in the discipline of alternative investments. So the number one benefit there is to use those marks. If you're handing your business card across, you have CAIA on your business card or on your LinkedIn profile, for example, that seems to be a very, very clear edge and clear benefit. The other thing I think you'll see is many employers are now asking for, you know, have you got your CFA? Have you got your FRM? Have you got your um, Kaya or your SEMA? Or are you working towards that? And we're increasingly seeing organizations now in the job specs are saying, if you'll be working in alternative investments, we'd like you to have your Kaya, or we encourage you to be working towards it. So again, that showcase of your proficiency, making yourself stand out, differentiating your skill set is certainly something which we see as being a key benefit to those who take the Kaya program. I mentioned that early bird window, um, that commenced on the 5th of April, um, that expires on May the 17th, and then the regular registration for our September exam runs right through to August. Now something about the Kaya program is both level one and level two are sat twice per year, both in March and in September of each year. So sitting here today, middle of May of 2020, you could commit to your level one and take that in September. Fingers crossed you put the work in and you pass. You could then subscribe and take your level two in March of next year. And literally today, we just posted our level two results. This time in one year to the day, you can't carry a member of the Kaya community. So it's a big lift. It's a significant amount of work, maybe 200 hours for level one and about 250 hours of study time is needed for level two, in addition to the time that you might take with a prep course as well. Um, but it isn't insurmountable. And uh, I think those dates are important to have in the back of your mind as well. And then just finally from me, um, if you haven't registered on the Kaya website, I encourage you to do so. Um, we have some great events um, and webinars and webcasts on content that's relevant to things that are happening within the alternative investments industry, not just the stuff that's, that's in the curriculum. We talk about new ideas and new things that are coming. The curriculum very much is 
is cutting edge versus bleeding edge. And that bleeding edge is what we'll, we'll do in these webcasts. So things like cryptocurrency, things like SPACs, things like this, you know, difference between private markets and hedge funds and things that are happening in some of the structures around the world. So if you want to learn more and keep current, um, please join us for some of those virtual webinars. We'd love to see you there. And you'll hear from the thought leaders within the Kaya family as well. So we have a tagline at Kaya that says, think like an alligator. Our investment has become the today. Investor comes first. I shared at the very beginning of my session today, thinking like an allocator, having that discipline, having that understanding is really important. So I hope you are going to give this some further thought. And I hope you have any questions Wait for those for the end of the session. And at that point, I've stopped sharing my screen and I'm going to hand the microphone back to Christy. So thank you for your attention. And Christy, I'll hand back to you if I may, please. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Joanne, for your presentation. We have learned so much from you. And um, now, um, may I pass the floor to our captain trainer, Larry? He will go through the, uh, ex uh, the Kaya um, program and also uh, give you a demo lecture. Okay. Good evening. Thank you for joining this uh, seminar. And also thank you, Joe. Uh, Joe did a very good update to us. Just um, give us the latest information of the alternative investment industries. Okay. So every time I listen to her, I, I learn something new. Okay. Okay, coming back here. Uh, my name is Larry, Larry Yuan. Yeah, I'm a lecturer at Kaplan, yeah, responsible for both the CAIA Kaya and also the CFA um, classes. Okay. Uh, a little bit of my background, yeah, I've been in the finance banking industry for more than 20 years before I moved over here. And I, I remember when I was um, um, still in my early stage, uh, in the industries and uh, not many people talk about alternative investments. I was in the fund management industries at that time. Uh, all we did uh, was just about uh, some very uh, uh, um, traditional hedge fund, I would say. I would put it this way, right? Traditional hedge fund at that time. And later on, we got a bit more uh, fund of hedge funds. And then I move on to private banking yeah, as a specialist. Uh, then I got the chance, uh, luckily, that I can meet with uh, various fund managers uh, doing alternative investments, yeah, including both hedge funds and uh, private assets. So that was um, getting more and more interesting in the markets. Yeah, we see more and more different strategies, products uh, in the markets. And also we see this, uh, as Joe just mentioned, the market is getting bigger and bigger. Okay, so what I would like to, to do today is uh, probably just um, give you some of this sharing, yeah, uh, how I look at the exam, yeah, the exam, the, 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 the curriculum, and uh, also the students' feedback and what they think about the exam. And then I can give you some uh, demo of the lectures just to highlight a few slides that we use in the class. Um, how do we deliver, and uh, what are the emphasis? Yeah, when we deliver the lecture during the class, uh, how do we put the focus on yeah, to make the learning experience as efficient as possible? Yeah, which is, I think, most important yeah, for us to prepare for the exam. It's not 
Well, of course, learning is very important. Yeah, I think the whole journey, uh, learning about alternative investment is very important. But then again, if we are going to take the exam, we have to put the exam as the top priorities. Okay? We learn, at the same time, we try to learn as efficient as possible. And that means the focus must be very sharp and very in line with the requirements of Kaya. And then I'll pass back to my colleagues. She will give you more details of the classes um, provided by Kleplan here, yeah, both online and offline. Okay, um, well here just saying that uh, there's a lot of different types of investors now nowadays, investing in the AI, alternative investments. And we also have students from uh, various um, groups of investors. Uh, here may be some corporate investors, or oh, not so much on the retail, but we have some institutional investors. Or maybe the government also investing in the real assets. So the students come to our class. Yeah, some of them may be working in a, for example, family office. Yeah, they are also kind of an institutional investors. Yeah, have different exposures to the AI. Yeah, maybe some others is uh, working as an analyst in hedge fund firm or a private equity firm. Or some others, even they are working at the front line as a sales or marketing people. Yeah, so you see, it's, it's quite diverse. Right, in terms of the participants of our class for the exam preparations. Uh, and the following slides are just to give an update of the market, but I, I think Joe has done a, a fabulous job already, right? Yeah, Joe has already given us the update how the market has grown. Yeah, and also the membership of Kaya has grown to more than 11,000 now. So these are just similar details. Yeah. Um, I leave it to you. Yeah, when you have time, you can go through this. Okay. Our benefits. Although Joe already mentioned about the benefits as a Kaya members, maybe here I just want to emphasize one point. Yes. Um, I joined Kaya uh, <laughs> really years ago. Yeah, a long, long time ago. Right. And uh, all along, I think it is very beneficial. Yeah. To um, to make use of the resources provided by Kaya to keep myself update, yeah, yeah, especially in the past couple of years, um, all this uh, very interesting and educational webinar, yeah, arranged by Kaya, yeah, which I think um, um, is very um, enlightening, yeah, for most people, whether you are a Kaya member or not, right? You you want to learn something, what is happening around, yeah, and. Um, for example, we have the access to the Journal of Alternative Investments, which is a quarterly publication. Uh, I think the latest um, issues, they talk about this uh, different kind of um, uh, infrastructure investments in India, in Africa, in the frontier markets. So these are the type of materials that you might not be uh, able to find somewhere else. And they also talk about crypto nowadays. Yeah. So if you are really, really interested in the new things happening in the world, I think it is a very good place to go to. Uh, membership growth, yeah, more than 11,000. And here is the, the syllabus. For level one and level two, um, level two, well, mostly is on this, uh, how are we going to allocate different type of alternative investments in the portfolio to achieve different goals and also very practical subjects like due diligence and manager selections. But I think here, yeah, uh, I think most of you are gonna start at level one, right? So maybe I, I just talk a little bit on the level one um, uh, syllabus here. Um, professional standards and ethics, uh, important topics, yeah, so it is just telling us, uh, there are some rules, guidelines that the uh, institutes expect us yeah, uh, to live up to, right? How do we behave? How do we work? Yeah, what are the duties for us when we work to the clients? What are the duties to our employers? What are our, uh, the expectation on us yeah, when we perform in the capital markets? So these are not law. 
not regulations by the government, but these are the industry standards. Yeah, industry standards, yeah, which are considered very important. Yeah. And and then from then onwards, you see there's um, introductions to alternative investments, followed by the four categories of alternative investments defined by Kaya. Students used to say that um, the introductions to alternative investments, this, well, which carries quite uh, heavy weighting, are demanding. Are demanding, right? Yeah. Of course, some of you might have some background in finance, uh, in statistics, um, which helps, which helps, right? Yeah. But overall. The introductions to alternative investments will, well, basically is uh, covering, of course, the background of alternative investments. Why is it different from the traditional investments? How do we measure the performance? Yeah, return is not just one single figures. The risk is not a single figures either. Yeah, there are various ways to look at the return and the risk, and. Um, if you have no background at all, right? Yeah, it could be quite demanding. Yeah, and uh, of course, it is all about hard work. Yeah, if you are committed, yeah, it is something that is not uh, unsurmountable. You can still uh, cope with it, I would say. But I just give you some ha um, heads up that in the past, students that they have no background usually find this section is the uh, bit challenging. Yeah, and then. From then on, the four categories of alternative investments. We are going to look at each of these, right, to know what they are. Yeah, for example, real assets, what are real assets? Yeah, it 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 covered all this. Well, in Hong Kong we always talk about real estate, properties, right? But okay, it is part of real assets. But apart from them, there are a lot more. A lot more, like uh uh, what Joe just mentioned, infrastructure. Infrastructure is one of the uh, high growth area in the real assets. Yeah. And also apart from that, we'll talk about different kind of uh, land investment like timber land, farmland, and also commodities. All, all these are real assets. Okay. Yeah. Of course, different AI, alternative investments, they might serve different purpose. And for real assets, of course, when we learn this, we're going to be Pay attention to what they are, and what functions do they serve, and what are the limitations or the practical issues when we put the money into these asset classes. So these are the requirements at level one. Yeah, and similarly for hedge funds, we are going to look at different type of hedge funds. Yeah, what are the risk and return characteristics of different hedge fund strategies? Right. Well, in the old days, in my old days, most people, when they talk about hedge funds, they always talk about these macro funds. Yeah. And uh, in Asia Pacific, there's a lot of boutique shop yeah, doing this uh, equity long short. Okay. So these are some of the examples of the hedge fund strategies. Yeah. So we're going to look at these major hedge fund strategies individually and see what are these characteristics of each of them. Yeah. Only by knowing their characteristics, then we can plan how to make use of them in our portfolio. Okay, so hedge funds, and uh, similarly for private equities, yeah, and uh, that also include the private debt as well. Nowadays, private debt is also a, a pretty large market. And lastly, but not the least, is the structured products. Yeah, structured products, well, well, if you work in the private banks, uh, I'm sure you have a lot of exposure to this um, uh, OTC structured products. Yeah, or might be uh, equity link, interest rate link, uh, any kind of market link products. Okay, so we will talk about this. And also, yeah, there will be other real structured products like um, uh, CDO, collateralized debt obligations, yeah, which is really a structured products, yeah, making use of different challenges to fulfill the different requirements of the investors. So this is what we are going to cover for level one. Yeah. It's quite a lot. It's quite a lot. Yeah. Our our course I think it 
uh, uh, it lasts for about um, two months or so, right? Yeah, around two to three months, right? We are going to cover all this within this time period. Okay, level two. Uh, the money, Joe talked about it already. Yeah, pass rate, okay. So coming back to the class. What we do here, yeah, as I said that, yeah, we try to expertise your study. We don't have much time. Well, I, I believe all of you uh, are working, right? You have to go to the office every day, yeah. So there must be a plan, a discipline, uh, a study plan to follow, yeah, so that you are properly prepared when you go to take the exam. And here in Kaplan, that is what we are trying to help, yeah, to exp expertise your study, to make sure that you don't spend too much time on certain topics, to make sure that you are on the right track, allocating your time to the topics properly. Yeah. And uh, yeah, how do we do it? We have classroom. Uh, I think my colleague later on will talk to you uh, about all these online, offline arrangements, our course materials, and also we provide the mock and the review at the end of the courses. Okay, now let's take a look. Yeah, just a few slides. Yeah, on some topics of level one. This is about the there's there's something called value at risk, or just VAR, the VAR. Yeah. It is one of the risk measures that we, we are uh, in the curriculums. Why I want to highlight this one here, yes. Again, one of the very typical questions that I got from my students is, uh, is it very quantitative? Yeah. Uh, does it take a lot of uh, mathematical knowledge to pass the exam? Not a lot, not a lot, all right. Well, of course, there are some calculations questions, yeah. But I, I think, well, we have to strike a balance here. And here, for example, value at risk, right? It is quite a quantitative subject, right? But we have to be clear as to what are we expected to learn. You look at, these are the requirements. We have to demonstrate the knowledge of this topic, and we are expected to be able to describe, to describe what it is, yeah. How do we get it? Yeah, you know, maybe how do we apply it? Yeah. And of course, there's something need to be calculated. For example, here, sometime, Okay, these are key word, yeah, to estimate. When, when we are expected to estimate, that means we need to do some calculations. Okay. So with this, maybe, it, during the class, we'll talk about the topics, we are to explain what it is. And here, we will just do it uh, with a layman approach, let's put it this way, right? The uh, risk is a measure of the downside. Yeah, so it is a specified approach to measure the downside. Here, mean, we all know, mean is average, average. Under normal circumstances, we should get the average result, okay? But as you know that, yeah, the possible outcomes could be better than the mean, could be worse than the mean, okay? Or, for example, if I use the Hong Kong Hang Seng Index as, a, as an example, right? Uh, well, I think the current level is about 28,000. Okay. So, what do you expect? The Hang Seng Index at the end of this year. It could be better than 28,000. It could be worse than 28,000, right? Yeah. So, we can use these measures yeah, to represent yeah, what could be the case if the Hang Seng Index performing badly. Yeah, what is the downside? What is the downside? Yeah. 
When we say this, okay, I can tell you that Hang Seng Index by the end of this year, well, it might, it might be traded in the range of 20,000 to 40,000. Yeah, I, I got pretty high confidence to say that. It is a big range, right? It's a big range, okay. So with this, the downside, 20,000, well, it could be, well, 30% downside that we'll see. And also at the same time, it comes with a probabilities. Yeah. So we are going to make a statement of the downside with the probabilities. It is a very efficient way to communicate to others, to the investors, yeah, about your view, about your view. That is how we use these risk measures. And for calculations, we need to estimate. We need to estimate, okay? We need to estimate sometimes, as usual, we use model, the model always has some assumption, assumptions. So during the exam, you need to be aware of the assumption behind. Yeah. If the exam tell you that, okay, this type of investments follow this assumption, in this case, it's normal distributions, then we can use this formula to do the calculations. To do the calculations, and again, yeah, the calculations may not be very important. Yeah, sometimes the question might ask you something else which could be, yeah, what are the factors affecting this risk measure? What are the factors here? Okay, there are quite a few here. So during the class, we'll just focus on, yeah, what we are expected to know. Yeah, instead of just doing calculations after calculations, all right? Of course, we still do calculations like this. Yeah, some examples to illustrate how we plug the figures together in the equations to work out the answer. And also, yeah, according to the curriculum, we are also expected to look at the investments, not just on the individual security spaces. If I may, I just go back a little bit here. We are also expected to, yeah, look at it from the portfolio angle. Portfolio means there's more than one investment, more than one securities put together. Yeah, how do we measure the risk of the portfolio? Yeah, on an overall basis. Okay, so we also need to look at different scenario. Yeah, to so see all these different assets, they, what are the correlations? Because the correlations, well, it is another concept we need to cover in that, um, in that sessions. And how does it affect, yeah, when we put different assets together, why do we think when we put an alternative investment in a traditional portfolio can help the overall portfolio to reduce risk? Yeah, so this kind of, again, diversification concept, yeah, we need to understand. Here is another example, yeah. Derivatives, right? Well, the, the topic they call it is the foundation of financial econo economics, but it is more related to options, derivatives. It is about uh, how it works. Again, uh, some of my students come to me that, oh, derivatives, it is very mathematical. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. But we are not required to do the mathematical part. Yeah, but what we need to know is how it works. What are the risk exposures when you buy an option or when you sell an option? Okay? And based on that, we have to recognize different kinds of exposure. What do we mean by different kinds of exposure? Here, as you know that options, well, basically, there's two types of options. Call options. Call options give you a right to buy, and put options give you a right to sell. Okay? And also, you can long a put options or you can short a put options. Okay? So here, call, put, long, short. These are the basic building blocks to understand options. Once that we understand this, we put them together. 
When we put them together, it is an option strategy. For example, cover core. Cover core is the underlying, the stocks. You short a call options. Okay. So here you see, if you own a stock, your payoff is the red line. Yeah. But you don't think the stock can go any further. You short, you short a call options to earn the call premium. Yeah. And therefore, your advantage is to have a better payoff, represented by the dotted green line. Yeah. But the downside is your upside here is capped because you sold the call options to your counterparty. If the stock goes further up, he will get the upside, not you. So we have to understand the different implication of long, short, call, put. Then they put them together, then we can analyze what's the result. And of course, that could be quite complicated strategies. Uh, this is the boost spread, best spread, right? Uh, we'll adjust yeah, the call options according to the strike price. With different strike price, they have different effect. Okay. So don't worry too much about this, yeah, but we are going to learn it step by step. And lastly, yeah, as usual, during the class, yeah, we have some questions. Yeah, I, I will try to go through more questions with my students. Yeah. So like this one, yeah. if you have an exposure to a commodity producer's debt, maybe you, you bought the bonds of Sinop, you know, this uh, Chinese oil company, yeah, you have the exposure to the oil company. And now, what is the best way to hatch this exposure? So if we can think, if we can think, what is our exposure to the oil company debt? And what is exposure by using different options or futures? So that when we put them together, yeah, the oil prices changes will not affect us. That is a hatch. So we have to discuss this A, B, C, D. Huh. What are the overall net exposures? Okay. Then we have to understand what is the implication of a call and a put, sell, buy. And I didn't mention about futures, but futures, as you know, is also another type of derivatives. Yeah, we can make use of this for hedging. So here I'm not going through A, B, C, D individually, of course, because we don't have enough time. <laughs> yeah, but uh, well, I, I can tell you the answer should be C. Yeah, and uh, later on when you come to my class, we can discuss further. All right, I think uh, that's all for my part. Yeah.